Hi, this is Elliot Fishman. Welcome to part five of our talk on small bowel obstruction. I don't think I've uh, gone to part five before, but I put so many slides into this talk and I just did not want to rush through it. So I think I've given you lots of uh, interesting cases, lots of points, and let's finish up with a few things. So when you talk about small bowel obstruction, we spoke about tumors, but we also speak about obstruction due to inflammatory disease. Here's a good example of an inflammatory process or even a mass going on in the mesentery. Dilated small bowel, look at these little dots. Look at the dots in the small bowel. What are we dealing with here? At first thought, you might say a perforation. Okay, maybe the patient had a foreign body and it perforated. That would be a thought. But then you start looking at the small bowel a little bit better and you realize there are multiple diverticuli in the small bowel. Now, we don't think about that all that commonly, but they do occur. We think about diverticuli in the sigmoid colon or the colon in general, but not in the small bowel. This is a beautiful example of inflammation of the small bowel, focal thickening of the small bowel, stranding in the mesentery and multiple diverticuli in the bowel with what ends up being small bowel diverticulitis of the patient's jejunum. This is something we can treat medically. You don't need surgery. It's not a perforation, it's inflammation. But it's a very important diagnosis because most people know very little about it and don't think about it. So it's an important diagnosis, jejunal diverticulitis. Here's another case, very similar diverticuli in the patient's small bowel. This is jejunum, thickened bowel, inflammation, jejunal diverticulitis. And here's just a few more images showing that case. And here it is on the coronal view. So get a feeling of what it looks like. Inflamed small bowel, thickened small bowel, but diverticuli in the bowel is the critical finding. And we typically don't think about that in the small bowel. This article is a lifetime ago. Um, diverticulitis of the small bowel is rare and is associated with high mortality, which is often due to delay in diagnosis. The CT findings in jejunal diverticulitis, although not specific, may suggest this diagnosis. Now, this was 1986. We know a lot more about the process. It's still uncommon, but I think we're better at recognizing it. Jejunal diverticuli is another article from a little bit later by Steve Rubinson. I'll have a characteristic finding on CT, discrete round or ovoid, contrast of fluid or air-containing structures outside the expected lumen of the small bowel with a smooth, barely discernible wall. That's very, very important. Our experience suggests that jejunal diverticulitis can often be recognized on the basis of these characteristic CT features. So a decade later, we were doing better. And going back to our article, diverticulosis of the jejunum and ileum is an uncommon entity around 1% or less. But when you look at some of the path diagnoses, when they look for diverticulite, it's a bit more common. And when you talk about small bowel diverticular disease, acute complications include diverticulitis, perforation, obstruction, and hemorrhage. But again, this is pretty rare, but if you can make the diagnosis, it's great. Now, the first two cases I showed you was jejunal diverticulitis, but it also can occur in the ileum. You can see the diverticuli in this case. What makes it a bit challenging in the right lower quadrant, there's so many things in the right lower quadrant. Tumors, like I showed you before, cecal, adenocarcinoma, lymphoma, but we think about also appendicitis. We think about even cecal diverticulitis. You don't maybe think about ileal diverticulitis. So in this case, you surely would recognize there's an inflammatory process going on, but only when you look very carefully and you realize you're not dealing with a cecal process primarily, but you're dealing with an ileal process. And yes, there are diverticuli in both the ileum and the cecum, but the epicenter is a terminal ileum, and this was ileal diverticulitis. An unusual diagnosis, but one we can make on CT. I do believe on the axials, you recognize the inflammatory process. I believe the diverticulitis is best seen on the coronal views, very nicely targeted on these images. Here it is with 3D showing it to you as well, very nicely defined. Now, when you talk about small bowel obstruction, we do put in there, particularly under intrinsic, inflammatory and infectious disease. And so we talked about inflammatory like jejunal or ileal diverticulitis. But what about this case? 
Look how dilated the small bowel loops, loops are. There's a mass that appears in the mesentery. There's some nodal disease. There's thickening in the mesentery. There's ascites. Maybe you think about carcinoid tumor. That would be a good possibility. There's lots of thickened bowel. There's some maybe desmoplastic reaction, though I don't see that to any great degree, but I see the mesenteric mass. So I'd be thinking of what gives me malignancy in the mesentery. But I think it's important to think about other things. So if this patient had HIV, for example, you got to think about what gives you a thickened small bowel pattern, not just dilated, the loops are thickened and a mass in the root of the mesentery. It's infectious processes can do it. MAI or TB are two of the ones. Look how thickened the small bowel loops are. They're dilated, the mesenteric mass, which ends up being adenopathy. I will agree in this case, if you said carcinoid tumor, or you said lymphoma with infiltration, I would have a hard time arguing with you. The bowel thickening could be in lymphoma, perhaps. Not the typical thickening for carcinoid, but the vessels are patent, but they are encased and slightly irregular. We spoke before how you get this desmoplastic reaction, but it's important to recognize this is where imaging is of a challenge and the history becomes important. And sometimes it's just not going to be perfect. You can say the small bowel obstruction, but more importantly or equally important, there's dilated thickened small bowel and there's a mesenteric mass with vessel encasement. And I got to be thinking of carcinoid or some process like that. We mentioned sclerosing mesenteritis, but it doesn't give you those thickened folds. What else could this be? Stretching of the vessels. Lymphoma is one to consider. But though I put carcinoid in front of that, but this was MAI. MAI in the right population, usually HIV or AIDS patients were thinking about MAI, MAI gives you mesenteric nodal masses. Often the nodes are of low CT attenuation. That can be helpful. Here it's not really low attenuation unless you have a vivid imagination. But MAI is a possibility and something to think about. Another example, FUO. What do I see here? I see some dilated bowel. Then I see what looks like nodes or some inflammatory process in the mesentery. There are periodic nodes and I'm tracking downward and there's a mass in the mesentery. Remember the last case, mass in the mesentery? And here there's cystic and low density changes. So now if I said, aha, this patient may have MAI, that's indeed a possibility. Mesenteric mass, low density nodes, periodic nodes. Again, you would think about lymphoma. Surely you have to think about that. Lymphoma typically doesn't give you low-density nodes unless a patient is treated. Whipple's disease can give you low-density nodes. Uh, germ cell tumors can give you low-density nodes. Again, you can see it nicely on the volume rendered views. And this was also MAI infection. So MAI, TB, infectious etiologies can be a real... Uh, a real difficult diagnosis because you surely have to think about malignancy. But I think when you have the low density nodes in a patient who has no primary diagnosis or no diagnosis of malignancy, you got to be thinking about MAI. Another example, what about this case? Dilated loops of bowel, but it's really focused on jejunum. Well, what involves jejunum? You could say sprue is one of the things. But if I went to infectious, these loops are really thickened. I would consider sprue, but what about infectious etiologies? What gives you dilated bowel loops in the jejunal region with really thickened folds? Okay, there it is beautifully seen on the coronal view. What should I be thinking about in that area? Well, I'm giving you a few other images, giving you more time to think. I quiz someone on this. This was geodiasis. So infectious etiologies, uh, we talked about MAI, we talk about TB, we talk about geodiasis, really thickened, dilated, small bowel loops, prominent enhancement, thickened folds, typically in the patient's jejunum, a wonderful case. One of the things I want to end with is that bowel obstruction may not be due to malignancy, may not be due to inflammatory disease, but can be structural. What I mean by structural is a vascular process, for example. We talk about SMA syndrome. There's decreased angle and distance between the SMA and the aorta. Now it's typically associated with marked weight loss, can be seen with anorexia nervosa, and originally described with total body casting. We have specific angles where the angles are decreased typically under 10 degrees with SMA, and the distance is under 10 millimeters, 
One thing with SMA syndrome that's very important to me, you can see patients, particularly thin patients, where the SMA angle, SMA angle is decreased, but there's no problem. When you have SMA syndrome, typically the duodenum is dilated proximal to the transition point behind the SMA. And the stomach may be dilated because you have what ends up presenting as a gastric outlet obstruction, but it's really duodenal obstruction. So this patient had presentation of gastric outlet obstruction. The stomach is markedly distended with fluid. Then you see as you track down the duodenum is dilated. The distance of the SMA to the aorta is decreased. And then you follow the dilated loops of duodenum going back right to the level of the patient's SMA. This is the classic appearance of SMA syndrome. Decreased distance, and I'll show you in a moment a decreased angle. You see how the SMA is just basically obstructing the patient's duodenum. A beautiful example of SMA syndrome right there and there. And there it is in the sagittal view. The SMA seems to almost touch the aorta. Classic SMA syndrome because the patient also has dilated bowel. Here's another case, dilated second to third portion of duodenum. There's the SMA. As we track it a little further, you can see the transition is coming right by the SMA. And here it is when we get the images nicely shown. There's the SMA. There's the obstruction. There's the narrowed angle, SMA syndrome. So you want to think about vascular processes. Now, we mentioned before very early in maybe part one about looking at the vessels when you have a malrotation, when you have a uh, small bowel uh, internal hernia, the vessels twist. So you want to look at the SMA always, look at the celiac always, but particularly here, looking when you're looking for obstruction proximally, look at the SMA angle. That becomes very, very important. Sagittal views, axial 3D work very nicely. And here's just another case of a hugely dilated duodenum. There's a transition point right by the SMA. You know even without the uh, sagittal view, that's SMA syndrome. And the angle is narrowed, not as bad as the other cases, but the transition is right by the SMA, a very classic case. Again, nicely shown images. And here it is again. So look at the coronals, but particularly look at the sagittals and look for those transition points. Another example, again, stomach's distended. But there is the duodenum, there's the transition point approaching the SMA, and there it is right there again. There's the narrowing, there's the SMA, there's the obstruction. So just very, very nice, a classic case of SMA obstruction. And here it is with cinematic rendering. Again, cinematic rendering is a nice view, doesn't change the diagnosis, but look on the cinematic rendering, the narrowing of the SMA angle beautifully shown in that example. Now, one of the things that's interesting, if you ask me where will things change in the future, well, it seems like AI is everywhere. And this article talks about machine learning prediction model for closed loop bowel obstruction using CT and clinical findings to predict the presence of obstruction and uh, how you should manage the patient. Now, I don't think the whole world is going to be AI everything, but it's, again, an interesting application, though this is a bit stretching the point as well. I think if you have a U-shaped configuration, you know it's obstructed, you, need, you know you need surgery. So that alone is not going to be AI, but we'll see what happens. And um, again, it's somewhat interesting, but I thought I would end with that. And concluding then, five-part adventure we've had together. CT is a study of choice for looking at the suspected or known small bowel obstruction. It plays a major role in triaging patients, whether patients are followed or whether they go to surgery. It's a very important management tool. It's important to have good imaging techniques. IV contrast is critical. Looking at coronals and sagittals are critical. And understanding the signs, the transition point, the feces sign, the enhancement of bowel, increased or decreased enhancement. All of these things are important. And I think if you look at all of them carefully, you'll do a great job. And with that, I'll just let you remind you and tell you that on CT is Us, in our teaching file, go to small bowel. You're going to see lots of uh, cases of small bowel obstruction. And I think one of the ways of learning about small bowel is just looking at lots of cases. So with that, I thank everybody for their attention and have a great day.
If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.